Welcome to the first episode of Africa by Toto, where the rains are always blessed. I'm Sheila. And I'm Sujita. Here on our podcast, we aim to focus on and shed a light on oral traditions from all around the world, specifically those from 10,000 BCE to 1500 CE. On our first episode, we'll be taking a closer look at the Asian region, in particular, India. First up, we'll be delving deeper into some insight on folklore, particularly the Jataka tales and its prominence, as well as the impact that they have on the society today. Folklore was considered as one of the main means of communicating a large part of traditional tales through the art of written text. They focused on maintaining and spreading a part of a community's culture and traditions in forms of stories to other communities who may or may not be aware of the existence of these tales. They were considered as a foundation for most people growing up as they listened and were told about various stories that, in turn, contributed to the lessons that they learned and were instilled in them over the years. They were also the origins of where most of the values that people continue to live by till today stemmed from. Now, some of you may be wondering, what exactly are the Jataka tales and how are they related to folklore? According to Vigo Folsbol, who was an expert in religious texts concerning Hinduism and some aspects of Buddhism, it is well known that amongst the Buddhist scriptures, there is one book in which a large number of old stories, fables and fairy tales lie enshrined in an edifying commentary. Dating all the way back to around 4th century BCE, these tales have withstood the test of time and have been a part of the growing up years for some generations. This reflects the prominence that it had in the past and its continued contributions in the following generations as well. This could most probably be one of the main reasons why they still have a place in today's society. People still believe these tales are reflective of how individuals should be. These tales were incorporated by the older generation in order to guide the values and attributes that will be instilled in the younger generation. According to a compilation of sources on Wikipedia, It's believed that they contain moral lessons that teach the importance of following traditions and to display reverence to elders, parents, and superiors. Let's take a moment to think about this. After hearing a little about the Jataka tales, regardless of where you're from or your cultural background, does it sound more familiar to you now? It's believed that those that were told in the past ended up being altered to fit into the culture that it is being told, but its adaptability goes beyond just a particular country or culture. Some popular tales have transcended across time and cultures, and some of them include the talking tortoise and the jackal and the crow. Hence, there's a high possibility that most people would be familiar with them one way or another. Regardless of how these tales were told, it is apparent that they have had some sort of impact. They have helped to shape individuals in terms of their beliefs and attitudes, and this has led to the evolution that has resulted in the way that they are today. Therefore, its prominence over the years should be credited and remembered for the way that it has developed the perspective of others and its place in the current society. However, one would wonder how exactly were the Jataka tales formed and what led to its existence? Well, It is crucial to note that like most oral traditions around the world, they were largely influenced by and stemmed from religion. As mentioned by Dr. Patrick Jory, an expert in Southeast Asian history from the University of Queensland, the Jataka tales actually had a monumental impact on Theravada Buddhism in particular. He had stated that the main focus of these tales consisted of parami, which entails perfection, virtue and moral attainment by the future Buddha over the lives of other individuals. Due to the high importance that religion held for the people, it ended up influencing their everyday lives as well. Religion can be credited as the origin of various oral traditions around the world, and this can be seen when we take a closer look into another type of oral tradition, the Vedic chants. Vedic chanting is the oral expression of poems, hymns, 
and invocations, originating from the religious practices of ancient India. It is the oldest sustained form of oral transmission and performance in the world, a tradition transferred from generations to generations in the ancient language of Sanskrit. The practice of Vedic chanting cannot, however, be addressed without establishing its link with the Vedas. The Vedas are a collection of ancient religious texts believed to be written between 1500 and 1000 BCE. The term Vid means to know and this gave birth to the term Veda signifying knowledge. The Vedas are therefore a series of books containing mythological accounts, poems, prayers and formulas considered sacred to the Vedic religion. Vedic chanting is often simply described and defined as the oral transmission of these Vedas. Yet, it must be acknowledged that the Vedas were only written centuries after the chants were originally composed. For writing did not develop on the Indian subcontinent until 8th century BCE. Isn't it truly remarkable how this tradition was kept alive solely by word of mouth in early times? As put forth by Harvard University professor of Sanskrit Michael Witzel, Vedic chanting is like a tape recorder, where not just the actual words, but even the long lost musical accent of the chants have been preserved up till today. Hence, Vedic chanting should be recognized for two reasons, namely giving birth to today's oldest living religion Hinduism and utilizing voice techniques that has allowed for the chants to be etched in people's memory for generations. Let's now chart the creator origins of the Vedic chants and Vedas for where there is a creation, there is its creator. The four Vedas include the Rig Veda or the knowledge of the hymns of praise for recitation. The Yajur Veda or the knowledge of the melodies for chanting. The Sama Veda or the knowledge of the sacrificial formulas for liturgy and the Adharva Veda or the knowledge of the magic formulas. These Vedas are not the work of a single person or even a person at that. They are said to have been breathed forth by God himself like smoke from fire. These works were then communicated to a number of rishis or saints who in turn transmitted them to their disciples. Ideally, these divine revelations were the direct gift from God to human beings. As highlighted by book author Wayne Howard, the Brahmins or caste of priests were involved in chanting the Vedas and as such Vedic literature is a reflection of the worldview of these Brahmins. They helped spread the stories of a multitude of deities and rituals. For instance, Agni, the Vedic god of fire, is a messenger between the realm of the living and dead. The act of cremation is thought to prevent the spirit of the dead from lingering in the world of the living and that Agni transports the soul of the dead. It is these stories of rituals and deities that have become a part of the cultural tradition and social values held by Hindus all around the world today. Vedic chanting and the Vedas have played their role in producing the widely practiced and revered religion of Hinduism. Vedic chanting is known as a sruti, meaning that which is heard. It is admirable that the Vedas are chanted exactly as they were several thousand years ago without reliance on text. 
But how exactly did the rishis achieve this feat? Well, they relied on the practice of elaborate mnemonic techniques to do so. These included techniques such as rhythmic and word duplication techniques. Ideally, the rishis have paid close attention to six factors to produce the Vedic chants as they should be recited. These factors include Varna or pronunciation, Swara or notes, Matra or duration, Balam or emphasis, Sama or continuity and Santana or punctuation. It was these factors and techniques employed that helped in remembering a centuries-old tradition. The fixed set of rules has maintained the rigour of the chants, allowing them to be chanted exactly as they were years ago, allowing them to even be recognised as an intangible cultural heritage of humanity by the United Nations Educational Scientific Cultural Organisation. As such, let us sit back and admire the tradition of Vedic chanting for this age-old tradition has contributed with the rise of Hinduism as a religion and utilize elaborate mnemonic techniques to preserve its form. This unique heritage and form of cultural expression has continued to grace its presence in today's world even amidst factors threatening it. It would be a disservice to think that Vedic chanting greatly relied on written text when in actual fact it has survived a time when there was an absence of writing. We as people can look to appreciate the effort that has been put into preserving the Vedic chants. Hence, despite being forgotten and overlooked most of the time, it is undeniable that oral traditions have had a significant impact on history and people around the world. Although there are multiple reiterations and interpretations, it is inevitable that regardless of the idea, most oral traditions technically have something in common, be it the values that are learned, the lessons that individuals take away, or how they are incorporated into the society. I think it's safe to say that no matter where you're from, there is a high possibility that you've been exposed to at least some type of oral tradition. And that's the beauty in it. It isn't just about being a part of the past, it's about how it's still a part of current time. With that being said, thank you for listening to the first episode of the Africa by Toto podcast, Africa by Toto Asia. We hope you've enjoyed it and see you in the next episode.